Dobra večer. Ne mislim da je pristupanje Europskoj uniji dobar odabir za Hrvatsku. Budućnost izgleda tmurno. Ljudi žive od iluzija i maštarija. I ako Europska unija ne bude više mogla dobro funkcionirati, neće patiti velike zemlje poput Francuske, Britanije ili Njemačke, već upravo male poput Hrvatske. Te riječi prije točno godinu dana u ovom našem studiju izgovorio veliki svjetski intelektualac, književnik i publicist. Tmurna budućnost o kojoj govorio upravo se događa. A s nama je iznova u studiju Tarik Ali. Socijalist, ateist, filozof, antiimperialist, filmaš, pisac, povjesničar. Tarik Ali rođen je u gradu Lahore koji je u to vrijeme bio pod britanskom kolonijalnom vladavinom. U obitelji koja prekida s konvencijama, a mladi Tarik uči osnove islama kako bi mogao raspravljati o njemu. Tarik Ali angažiran je intelektualac koji cijeli svoj život raspravlja o najvažnijim političkim i društvenim pitanjima. Inspirira studente, intelektualce, o svjetskim je pitanjima znao raspravljati i s Johnom Lennonom, pa je pjesma Power to the People rezultat njihovih razgovora. On je također jedan od ljudi koji stoje iza čuvenog časopisa New Left Review koji je pokrenut još 60-ih i koji danas predstavlja nezaobiloznu točku bilo kakve intelektualne debate. On je također jedan od urednika izdavača Verso iz Londona koji između ostalih objavljuje i Slavoja Žižeka, ali i skoro sve najvažnije današnje intelektualce koje bi se mogli nazvati progresivno. Dakle, radi se o jednoj prilično zaokruženoj ličnosti koja je živjela u skladu sa svojim vremenom uvijek angažirana. Od godina borbe po ulicama koje su otpjevali Rolling Stones i misleći upravo na Tarika Alija do intelektualnih debata. Ikona moderne ljevice posljednjih je godina redoviti gost subverzivnog festivala koji je ove godine u Zagreb doveo prijatelja i kolegu Olivera Stouna s kojim je radio na neispričanoj povijesti SAD-a i nekim drugim projektima. Prvi put prije nekoliko godina doći do Tarika Alija nije baš bilo lako, jer mu je raspored dosta bukiran, putuje svuda po svijetu i zapravo nije znao što može očekivati u Hrvatskoj nakon raspada Jugoslavije i nakon zadnjih 20 godina. Ali od tada evo Tarik Ali dolazi u Hrvatsku svake godine. Prošle godine je spomenuo i zanimljivu anegdotu da je šetao gradom, da se jedan taksist zaustavio i derao se Tarik, Tarik. Zagreb, Hrvatska i cijela regija pridobili su ga energijom, kaže Horvat. Pita se što se ovdje dogodilo, jesu li ekonomski razlozi proizvali nacionalizam. Balkan je uvijek zanimljiv i važan, smatra Tarik Ali. Tarik je, ne znam, kada jednom plivate sa nekim u komiži na moru, onda znate da vam je taj čovjek prijatelj jako opušten, voli dobro vino, voli se zezati, a isto vremeno u svakom tom trenu vodimo ozbiljne rasprave. On je bio u Vjetnamu 60-ih godina, sreo je Malcolm X-a nedugo prije nego je Malcolm X ubijen. Poznavo je Čaveza, dakle Tarik Ali je jedna osoba od koje se može zaista jako puno naučiti. Prije godinu dana u drugom formatu govorio je o ulazku Hrvatske u Europsku uniju. Ne demokratsku organizaciju, kako ju je tada Ali nazvao, čiji parlament nema stvarnu moć. Kao ni male zemlje koje postaju europska periferija. Vjerojatno nije promijenio mišljenje. Dobar večer još jedan put, dakle s nama u studiju je Tarika Ali, dobra večer i vama. Izvjetno mi je drago da ste došli, ovo osjećam nekako kao da imamo starog prijatelja u studiju s kojim možemo ponovo razgovarati o teškim problemima koje muče ovu našu malu zemlju, evo danas već pred vratima Evrope, za nešto više od mjesec dana ući ćemo u Europsku uniju. Htjela bi da nam malo pomalo da se prisjetimo našeg prošlog intervjua pri točno godinu dana kada ste nam rekli ove riječi koje sam ja koristila u najavi i bili prilično skeptični prema tom našem pripojenju zajednici. Naravno, što se dogodilo u zadnjih godinu dana ovako, iz vaše perspektive gledano? Što se događa u toj Evropi? Well, the situation has got much worse. We have mass unemployment of young people and old people, but mainly young people growing up the new generations. 40, 50% of them will be out of work for the foreseeable future. In even large countries like Spain, uh, like France, 
Last year, I was a bit more optimistic. I thought the large countries might do better, but now they're being affected as well. Uh, and what is happening to them will be multiplied and exaggerated in the smaller countries, like Croatia and other, and other countries, Ireland, uh, Portugal even, uh, where there's no future for, for young people. So the European Union as we all suspected, had a choice. It could either be a social Europe or a banker's Europe, a Europe for the rich or a Europe for all the people. And they chose to make it a Europe for the elites, a Europe for the rich, uh, with very little democratic accountability. So Croatia is supposedly an independent country, it was very proudly it became independent, but you know, all that sovereignty is going to disappear. And you will be taking orders from the European Bank, or the, to be frank, from the Deutsche Bank. Uh, that is what is going to happen. I cannot foresee, unless there's some unpredictable thing, that this uh, situation is going to change in the foreseeable future. So. As they say, when you're going to make a tough landing, keep your seat belts tightened. Nisam htjela ovaj razgovor odmah krenuti sa teškim temama, ali kada ste spomenuli nezaposlenost, možda bismo mogli u stvari krenuti od nje. Prema nekim istraživanjima koje su objavljene u Americi, 90% ljudi, odnosno ogroman broj ljudi koji su nezaposleni dulje od šest mjeseci, zapravo više i ne žele raditi, gube interes za posao i nastupa neka vrsta apatije i depresije. To je dakle neko istraživanje koje je provedeno u zemlji daleko od nas, međutim, vidljiva je, ta je situacija vidljiva i u Hrvatskoj, vjerujem da je vidljiva i u drugoj, drugoj zemljama Evrope. Kako vi, htjela bi da malo ostanemo dakle na toj jednoj osobnoj razini ljudi koji ste upoznali ili iskustva koje ste čuli. Na koji način čovjek kao dakle ljudsko biće reagira na tu, na, na trenutke bez posla, na tu jednu e, zapravo besmislenost života, apsurdnost života koja mu se na neki način e, stavlja ispred njega u trenutku kada nije bitan zajednici, kada za njega nema mjesta na ovom svijetu? Well, I think one can only imagine how people feel and not just in Croatia or Bosnia Herzegovina but in any country where there is no work available and where people live on handouts from the state very modest handouts so they can never live life to the full a lot of their faculties will no will not be used and they get used to this a uh, daily routine which is you know, probably they, they still have enough money to uh, buy a cell phone and look on it to talk to people, become completely self-absorbed in, in themselves and the limited lives that they are permitted to uh, lead, communicating with friends in similar situations and getting more and more depressed because they see that the societies in which they live offers them nothing and it's very depressing and I'm prepared to predict to you that the number of suicides amongst young people will begin slowly to go up it's happening in some European countries especially among 20 year olds 20 year old men in particular and the reason for that are complex and varied but one of them is not having any belief any hope in a future under this particular system of neoliberal capitalism which has not changed despite the huge crisis so the way it affects people uh, is it makes them despair and despair is an emotion that leads to passivity never activity and so people basically move away from society even though they are dependent on it for getting some money a month to live but the fact that we are living in societies that actually do this to their young people and elites of politicians and bankers busy making money and putting the money in secret bank accounts so they don't even have to pay taxes or keeping it in their cupboards it's disgusting there's no other word for it that a society which cannot look after its poor after its young people is a sick society što se dogodilo s našim odnosom prema političarima prema ljudima koji vode 
naše zemlje. Vjerujem da postoje jedno temeljno nepovjerenje u vladu, u vlast, zapravo u mehanizam države. Da i tu postoji jedan osjećaj da tko god došao na vlast neće se ništa promijeniti. Zašto je to tako? I postoje li, vidite li vi, vi volite govoriti da ste dakle u 60. i 70. postojala je neka nada, danas ne postoji. Vjerujete li da će postojati neka nada, da će doći do nekakvog obrata? Well, I think one must never give up hope. And there are many people, the young people who occupy squares, who take over public spaces, who build mass movements, are people who haven't given up hope. And I always support them. But underlying even their activities is a feeling that politics is not going to change anything. And that is true of mainstream politics today. You know, it's not just in this country. It's visible here too. But almost in any European country, it doesn't matter for most people if you have a center-left government or a center-right government. The social economic policies they follow are more or less the same. And this is actually affecting the functioning of democracy. So people are saying, is this what democracy is? And the answer is yes. Under this form of capitalism, no real diversity is permitted. We can say what we like on television or in the press, or even the print media is now quite controlled. But we can still say, but it has no effect. And that is what is frightening. And you have these countries which, uh, you know, all over Europe, which I describe being ruled by an extreme center. They make war on their own people through austerity measures, through imposing policies that create mass unemployment. Abroad, they go to a war whenever the United States wants them to. They put up their little hands, say, please take a few of our soldiers to war. We want to fight with you. So the, these, this extreme center is very dominant in most parts of Europe today. Uh, and this applies to Britain and France as well. You know, the only issue on which the right, center-right and center-left seem to be divided is what? It's gay marriage. In Spain, where the Catholic Church mobilizes large numbers of people, in France, where again Catholicism is becoming very strong. This is supposed to be a republic, a secular republic, you know, very, very integrist. And here now you have the church playing a big part. You have mass unemployment in France. The largest demonstration in Paris a few weeks ago was not against unemployment, but was against gay marriage, a million people. A million people in the streets of Paris. So we are seeing a strange disintegration of traditional forms of politics, political protests, social protests, etc. And where this will end is difficult to predict at the moment. I'm worried because, you know, in many parts of Europe you have right-wing and extreme right-wing currents emerging and some young people feeling no hope at all are aligned to them, looking for scapegoats, the Roma, the Muslims, whoever. Mm -hmm. Htjela sam vas pitati, naravno, i malo osobnih pitanja. Bili ste nam tu točno prije godinu dana. Kako čujemo, situacija je još strašnija nego što ste predviđali. Veliki interes medija za vas, evo, kolegica Ivana Dragičević također razgovara o temama, dakle, i o vašem posjetu u Zagrebu. Prepune Kino Evropa, brojna publika dolazi čut što imate za reći. A mene zanima, naravno, razgovarat ćemo i o medijima, ali prije toga što ste vi radili u zadnjih godinu dana? Gdje ste bili? Kako izgleda vaš svakodnevni život? Čime ste se okupirali? Well, <clears throat> I do what I do. I write books, I write essays, um, I write articles, uh, I go around and speak, um, you know, in different parts of the world, never the same part. Zagreb I come to more often because I like the subversive uh, cinema festival. It's very unusual, very unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else. And it attracts now a mix of filmmakers, old, established, and young. You have Oliver Stone coming this time for the first year. Um, 
and philosophers from all over the world and th it creates an atmosphere which traditional politics cannot create anymore which is one reason for its popularity that people come to see movies or documentaries and hear ideas which are not normally available and this to a lesser scale is also true in some literature festivals the attendance at these festivals is increasing because they have almost become a substitute for real political debate which doesn't take place in Parliament. It's quite interesting. So that is what I've been doing. The other thing, um, I was asked um, by a German theatre in Essen, a big theatre, uh, to write a play for them. And the director is a, it's a German theatre, I'm the writer and the director is French. Jean-Claude Beruti, whose plays are performed at the Youth Theatre in Zagreb quite regularly. Um, and the play they wanted me, it was their idea, it was not my idea. And the play they wanted me to write was a modern version of Don Quixote, Cervantes. So we discussed, and I said a modern version can't be putting the old characters in modern clothes, which is very boring. But everyone knows that story. But what will make it very interesting is getting those two characters, Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and their animals on which they are riding, suddenly arriving into the 21st century and having a set of adventures. So what do they see when they arrive in this continent which they know well? They see once again religious fanaticism. They see Roma people being burnt, auto da fez, which they have already experienced in the medieval period. They witness a huge and growing economic crisis, which was existing in Spain in the 17th century when Cervantes was writing. A huge economic crisis. They are witnessing wars, which were taking place at that time in a different context, etc., uh, etc. Et so the play is called The New Adventures of Don Quixote, and it is about the world today and I've spent a lot of time doing that and working with the director and that will open in Essen on the 1st of November so it is you know provided more variety to my usual schedule and it's been very enjoyable uh, doing it it's mm -hmm. uh, it's both very sharp but it's also very, they, the director likes it very much. He says it's also very funny. So it's not propaganda play or agitprop. It's a real attempt to look at the world today from all, with old eyes. Osjećate li se vi osobno ponekad kao Don Quixote u borbi s vitrenjačama, odnosno u borbi sa sistemima moći oko nas? No. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel that because I can recognize an enemy when I see it. I don't have to tilt at imaginary enemies. Our enemies are only too real. It is the people who sustain and support without criticism this system which is destroying so many lives. Not in the sense in Europe at any rate of killing people but of making their lives miserable. Uh, and in other parts of the world of killing. I mean, the drone attacks which Obama justifies uh, nonstop are killing people. Hundreds of people are dying in Africa, in, in Pakistan, and the drone has now become a very popular weapon. Every country is saying, can we manufacture drone attacks? And in the United States, some chiefs of police in d big cities have said maybe we will need drones to defend ourselves in our own cities. So what they are using at the moment in other parts of the world will be used against their own people if they consider it necessary. And this is the world we live in. Mm. Uh, so one doesn't need windmills and imagine that there are some, you know, you can see what is really going on and why it's important to carry on arguing against this. Mm -hmm. uh, kada ste spomenuli suradnju s kazalištem, podsjetilo me naravno na krizu koja vlada i u tom kulturnom sektoru, u, u stvari naravno kriza jednom kad krene, krene zahvaćati sve. Međutim, evo i Hrvatska doživljava velike promjene, uh, dakle, privatizacija medija koji onda dakle, imaju manje kulture, od kulture se očekuje da bude više spektakla, manje, 
možda netko tko opstaje na državnom novcu, ukidanje sredstava i tako dalje. Sve su to strahovi koji muče i hrvatsku kulturu i pogotovo naravno sada pristupanjem u EU. Zanima me kako vi gledate na te procese koji se događaju i kako uopće spasiti to, dakle neke vrijednosti koje doista jesu javno dobro i trebali bi biti dostupne svima i na kraju krajeva ne bi se trebalo očekivati od njih da budu komercijalne isplative. Well, uh, what we are witnessing today is two intertwined processes. You have politically the dictatorship of capital. And in culture, you are increasingly beginning to see what I have defined many years ago as a process of market realism. During the Stalin period in the former Soviet Union, Stalin's ideologues developed something which they call socialist realism which was all your paintings, all your novels, must have some element in it which can be, which is propaganda. And they attempted to limit art in that way. And they failed, because there is no socialist realist masterpiece, either in the cinema or uh, in literature. Uh, there are some interesting paintings, but that's about it. Uh, Now we have in the, in the world which exists today market realism, that a product is, on, well, a product is only considered successful um, if it sells a lot of copies. So you have people look at the bestseller lists of the New York Times and say, ah, how many of these books can we afford? Many publishers don't even read these books in the non-English speaking world, they say, yeah, this is the bestseller list. Okay, let's take two. Maybe we can buy them for our, our, our countries. So you have a process both of market realism, the market dominates, and homogenization. That books which sell in the US must automatically sell everywhere else. Leave alone whether they're good books or bad books or mediocre books. But the fact that they're automatically taken. Or The power now of the American film and television industry, which dominates and which has led in countries like Germany, France, Italy, which had a very strong cinematic tradition, and the former Yugoslavia, by the way, have produced some amazing films, and many Eastern European countries too, Hungary, uh, the former Czechoslovakia, Poland. That process of Cultural independence is also being destroyed. Mainly what we see now is mimicry. How can we make an action movie? How can we make a thriller? Which American film really appeals to us? Let's do our version of it. So with the destruction of political diversity and political sovereignty, you are also seeing increasingly an abandonment of cultural sovereignty. And if everything is judged by the lowest common denominator, then you will have effectively bad shows and bad theater and bad television. I mean, much of what is now done on television, not everything, but quite a lot in the cultural domain is awful, really bad. All over Europe, it's like that. Uh, it's not just in one or two countries. And this is a dangerous process. That's the bad side. The good side <clears throat> is that it is forcing many young people to make their own films, to make their own documentaries. And here the development of technology that you or I could go with our little camera and make a documentary and record it and its production values may not be very good, but we can do it and we can put it on YouTube. And if it's really good, it can take off. So there is an alternative which this system has created for its own reasons, but which we use as well, and which they have so far not been able to curtail. And that, I think, is an important thing. And lots of people are making indie independent movies, independent cinema. And it's encouraging people to say, okay, you know, like in politics, they say, no, the political system is tainted and filthy. We have to do something ourselves. In culture, too, that is beginning to happen. The most difficult aspect of that is in theater, where you need a stage, where you need subsidies from the state to maintain a culture. And you know the other thing, 
in the cultural domain is that what we used to have in the previous decades was the right to fail. So a television head of drama would say to you, you want to make this film? I'm not sure about it, but try it. Maybe you will succeed. That right to fail the market takes away because everything is determined by money. And that, I think, <clears throat> is very dangerous. You know, once my friends who did the Monty Python uh, series on British television, one of them was telling me that when we first went to the BBC in the 70s uh, and said, we have an idea, Monty Python, and the, the guy, the head of light entertainment at the BBC was sitting, saying, OK, show me your jokes. And John Cleese and um, Terry Jones did a very funny act. And they th thought it was funny. And the guy sitting in front of them said, hmm, I don't find it funny at all. It doesn't appeal to me. But I'll give you money to make six programs. Maybe some people will like it. <laughs> and it became, as you know, a complete cult. And that is how it used to be no longer. Everything is controlled, everything is determined by money, even on state television networks which try and mimic private television. So it's not good, but we fight it as, as best we can. And you know, you still have people who make good theater, who make good movies, and young people are beginning to do this more and more in, the, in cinema and making documentaries which challenge the dominant ideology. So I'm not as pessimistic on the cultural front as on the political front. Ne znam koliko smijete govoriti o novom projektu koji planirate s Oliverom Stonom, a najavili ste da ćete ga pisati u Hrvatskoj. To bi sigurno zanimalo naše gledatelje da ćete provesti jesen na otoku Visu. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that because, you know, it's better not to talk about film projects because so many of them don't happen. But it's true I'm working on a big project uh, and I will write it on the island of Vis, which I, I love very much and which is different from all the other islands, which Korčula, Brač, etc., which are beautiful but now very big and very crowded and very touristy. Uh, and Vis, I think, has been saved because it was once controlled by the Yugoslav army, so they did not allow any building on it, which is very positive, and I hope the Croatian government keeps it under control, because that is a beautiful coastline, very peaceful, very calm, with a very wonderful lobster restaurant in Komisa. So I, I like it very much, and uh, I will try and spend September there to do some work. But it's for work, not pleasure. But also the sea is close by, and I love swimming, so I will do my swim and write, and I hope something will come. Htjela bih vam pročitati jedan mali citat iz vaše knjige Sukob fundamentalizama. Radi se o vjeri. Htjela bih nam kratko nešto o tome da prokomentirate. U prvom poglavnju ateističko djetinstvo, dakle započinjete. Zapravo nikada nisam vjerovao u Boga. Čak ni na tjedan dana, čak ni između šeste i desete godine kada sam bio agnostik. Ovo nevjerovanje bilo je instinktivno. Bio sam siguran da ondje vani nema ničega osim prostora. Je li vam bilo teško živjeti u toj nevjeri? Ljude to sigurno zanima kako se nositi sa životom, sa životnim nedaćama i sa problemima kad imate tako čvrste stavove i kad već od malih nogu znate da ne vjerujete u Boga. I have not had any difficulty with this. And you know, nowadays it's difficult to imagine this, but I was growing up in a Muslim country, in a Muslim society. And I think back now to all my friends at school and at university in Lahore, in Pakistan. None of them were believers. Actually, in this part of the world, you shouldn't find that very difficult because many of my Yugoslav friends or Bosniaks or who are Muslims culturally uh, and born into the religion didn't, were not believers. So you have this tradition of dissent and skepticism. I, you know, it's, it's just like, for me, the idea of God or God's son, which is even more surreal that God only had one son 
and uh, uh, this is a sort of mythology of the Catholic Church, um, and that he gave up his life uh, to to redeem the world, etc., etc. These ideas are useful as a crutch. Like if you are lame and you can't walk or you have one leg, you need a stick with which to walk. And for me, people who are, you know, I don't criticize them because it's their right. If they feel mentally that they need help, instead of going to a psychiatrist, which is expensive, they believe in something up there. Because I don't like the sort of atheists who have become fundamentalist atheists. I don't like fundamentalism of any sort religious or political or dogmas that like that and atheists who have become so hardline and fundamentalists who attack religion non-stop as if nothing else exists in the world I don't like that because the fact is that religion has existed now in some shape or form for four or five thousand years we can argue <clears throat> were the Greek gods and goddesses more interesting than the single God in the sky in which Christians, Jews, and Muslims believe. Uh, this is the belief of these three monotheistic religions. The Buddhists don't believe in that. The Hindus don't believe in that. And in the old days, no one believed in that. You needed different gods and goddesses to reflect all the problems that existed on earth. So you identified with a particular god, a god of war when you're making war, a god, goddess of love when you're making love, whatever. More interesting, um, and the myth, ancient Greek... Uh, mythologies, I grew up reading them. I always loved them, actually, because they were like adventure stories. So this m monotheism imposed limitations on the capacity of people to think. And the many of the early religions were very sharp. This is how you have to think. This, it went on till, you know, I mean, the big events like not being able to see uh, how the bodies in space moved even. You, you weren't even allowed to think that. So religious dogma held the world back. And I've never felt the need for it, to be honest with you. I, I understand people who do. I don't criticize them. But on a personal level, people have the right to do what they want. It's when religion enters politics that I'm then very critical whether it's Islam or Christianity or Judaism, and we have examples of all three. Uh, and the organized church and the organized uh, aspects of religion are deeply reactionary in most cases. Not everywhere, but in most cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, drago mi da ste spomenuli uh, o prestanak mišljenja, odnosno uh, manipulaciju ljudima kroz uh, nemišljenje. Uh, jer upravo na festivalu na kojem vi gostujete i na brojnim drugim konferencijama se tjera ljude upravo da misle, da se zagledaju u sebe. Ali to nas dovodi naravno i do medija danas. Do medija koji su također na neki način postali um, glavni manipulatori, mogli bismo reći, našeg mišljenja. Kako vi gledate na tu sliku svijeta? Jesu li mediji doista danas, s obzirom da, da su sve što nas okružuje, da izvan njih gotovo da i ne postoji stvarnost, jesu li uh, doista uh, toliko uh, snažni u oblikovanju našeg mišljenja, odnosno ne mišljenja, spriječavanja da budemo možda uh, malo više analitičari prema sebi? Well, you know, I know that it's very fashionable these days to attack the media non-stop and blame the media for the problems of society. That is not my opinion. I think the media reflects the needs of the rulers of this society. It's always been the case by and large. You know, whatever sort of system you live under, there was a very limited period when the Western media had a lot of freedom. That was during the communist phase in Europe and the existence of the Soviet Union. And the main purpose was to show the Russians and the Eastern Europeans and the East Germans, look, we have a free media, we allow dissidents to appear, there's a lot of diversity. The minute that system ended, diversity slowly ended within the global media. So it's not unrelated to the state of uh, the world. And today the media is really bad. And the war of images that sometimes goes on, you can watch a report from, say, Syria on CNN and BBC World. 
and that same day you would have different images coming from Russian television or Iranian television. And you can actually access these if you are so interested in this, which many people aren't, and just compare the images and try and form a picture of what is going on. It's difficult. That's one point. The second point is this. If you say that the media is all-powerful, it makes you powerless. And when I look at the developments in South America, it completely challenges this view of the media being all-powerful. In Bolivia, in Venezuela, in Ecuador, to name but three countries, 98% of the media was against the late Hugo Chavez, against Evo Morales, against Rafael Correa. And the Ecuadorian media was so bad, they're making up lies of... Despite all this, these people won. They won, not once, but a number of times, which shows that people are not as stupid as some imagine. That when it comes to making choices which affect their daily lives and their futures, they ignore the media. Yeah, they watch soap operas, they watch soft pornography, whatever you want. But when it comes to making choices, they don't necessarily listen to what the media is telling them. This was also true during the Iraq war that the media was saying Saddam Hussein is weapons of mass destruction, but millions of people didn't believe them. They came out and demonstrated against the war. So I think we must be careful of demonizing the media too much or of giving it a position which in reality it doesn't enjoy. It's just part of the societies in which we live today. Very few people trust it. Fewer people believe it. They switch it on because they're used to it. And they watch these images. Sometimes, of course, when the United States wants to go to war, these images are used in a particular way, very carefully and repeated and repeated and repeated. And uh, people then say, oh, God, we've got to do something. Let's go to make war. And then the images which you should be getting from the effects of that war, you never get like NATO bombed Libya for six months. Not a single image of the results of that bombing on Libya or how many people were killed. That is the pernicious side of the media, but all-powerful, no. Moram vas pitati jedno osobno pitanje. Čega vas je u životu najviše strah? What do I fear? Personally, I don't particularly fear anything. You know, I don't fear death. We all have to die, and not being religious helps. Because one aspect of religion is to reduce the fear. Religion is a lot to do with the fear of death. Because in all these religions, in different forms, you have the view that once you are dead, you will go to hell or heaven or purgatory or some transitional station where you have to prove you're good before you can either go up or down. <laughs> all this, all this is designed to stop people fearing death. It plays a very important uh, part in, um, in religion. And so there are images of heaven. In the Islamic heaven, the images are very erotic. That if you are a man, not for women, but if you are a man and you have led a pure life or you have been good and you are sent up to heaven, uh, you will have... You can drink, you can't drink on earth, you can drink in heaven, you can have sex for 99 years. Oh, I can't even go into it. It's, it's fantasy, but quite interesting fantasy. Uh, but if you don't believe in any of that, what is the reason to fear? You know that what the laws of biology are, that you die. You live, you die. And you usually, you know, die after a certain age unless you are afflicted by death. So I, I have no fear of that. I mean, so on a personal level, nothing. But as a human being, I fear what is happening to the world. You know, when I look at countries where nothing is being done for poor people, when I look at the country in which I was born, Pakistan, where the statistics show that 60%, this is a country of 200 million people, that 60% of the children that are being born in that country 
are born either moderately or severely stunted. So they will never grow tall as they used to once because of malnutrition. I, that makes me angry and I fear for them and their futures. And similarly in, in, in other parts of the world, you know, when I s see what is happening in parts of uh, Africa and now parts of Europe. So for me, it has never been a personal thing, you know, what will happen to me. It's not important in the scale of things. So I'm an individual, I will live, I will do what I do, I'll die, full stop. Ne bih htjela da završimo s takvom rečenicom, premda drago mi je da imate taj stav, naravno što će biti, bit će drago mi da ste nam došli u studio. Evo, završavamo ovaj razgovor, htjela bih da dođete naravno iduće godine u Hrvatsku na Subverzi festival, vjerujem, prije ćemo se možda sresti negdje, nadam se da će prognoze, neće biti tako crne, premda evo, ništa se dobro nije dogodilo u godinu dana. Hvala vam lijepo i želim vam ugodan boravak u Zagrebu ovih još nekoliko dana koliko ste tu. Hvala i vama, dragi gledatelji, vidimo se ponovo za sedam dana do tada, srdačan pozdrav od cijele ekipe drugog formata.